team um, to give this talk, the, the, the SOC as well. And kudos as well to, to taking Strings 2020 online. I, I'm sure that in some ways that may have been more complicated than actually organizing a, a, a conference uh, in, in, in real space. Um, yeah, good afternoon to everyone. Here, it's afternoon here in Pretoria, South Africa. Um, yeah, I, I'm really delighted to be able to, to um, give you this review talk on the EHT and, and I'm certainly honored to follow um, Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Pekeng from the University of uh, Cape Town, um, a beautiful campus where I spent my undergraduate years. And I'm sorry, many of you who would have perhaps spent your, had your first visit there this week uh, are not able to do so. Um, I strongly suggest you find another reason to, to visit at some point in the future and I hope that comes soon. Um, I'll be honest, this is my first strings uh, conference, um, and indeed the theoretical physics conference in general. I started out, I did my undergrad at UCT in, in electrical engineering before moving on to observational astrophysics and specifically radio astronomy, um, which is the window with which we observe um, black hole shadows. Um, so in today's talk, I'm going to be giving you, a, you know, the presentation of the ESG results really much from that viewpoint. And I hope that it'll give you a sense of what goes into the experiment, um, the processing, the algorithms that are required to, to, to do this physics, um, and hopefully spur some, some thought um, on, the, on the theoretical aspects thereof. Um, as Amanda mentioned, you know, in addition to this conference that would have been hosted at, at this, in a beautiful South African city, um, and indeed for the first time in Africa, um, I thought I would also take the opportunity to highlight some of the scientific potential there, there, uh, that, that there is in expanding the EHT array into Africa. Um, we have a strong geographic advantage for several telescopes across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and as you'll see in this talk, uh, this is especially true for observing the black hole at the center of our galaxy, which lies directly overhead um, from a, uh, from a uh, latitude of about minus 30 degrees where many of our telescopes are. So I'm, uh, I'll emphasize that um, and, and, and also just speak to, I think, the, the, opportunity, the, the, the huge opportunity, scientific opportunity we have with EHT. It's really just getting going in many senses um, as, as the array is expanded. All right, so with that, uh, let me, um, to no longer see me by sharing my screen. Um, and I'll kick off by emphasizing that this is really a talk on behalf of a very, very large team. Um, this is a photograph of some of them at our collaboration meeting back in November, 2018, when we all had a secret that we were hiding. Um, and, um, one looks at this, this is over 200 scientists uh, at 59 institutions in 18 countries. So, you know, we, we have to use Earth-sized telescopes to, to do the science we're interested in, but we really have to use um, broad expertise across the globe. Um, and this image captures some of those brilliant people from engineers to, um, to theorists to uh, observational experts. Um, and it really takes this huge coordinated effort to, to put, pull this off. So yeah, you can see some Cheshire cat smiles um, in November 18 before the results of this were um, announced in April of 2019, which I'm sure many of you would have seen. Um, so the talk, I'm going to just give you an overview of the instrument and our science goals. Uh, I'll then review the first imaging results on M87, um, which you saw last year. And then, as I said, speak to the future, the upcoming results, and, and specifically the array uh, expansion. So um, the, the EHT is made up of 13 stakeholder institutes, which are many of these run facilities that make up the EHT array, and many online might be from some of these. Um, these have really, um, these have membership on a board, and then there are um, affiliated members. And again, I'm sure there are many people from these institutes and perhaps you've seen talks um, on the EHT um, from in, in one of these institutes, but these are the affiliated. And from South Africa, um, I'm affiliated with the University of Pretoria and a visiting fellow at Rhodes University, which you might find in there. Um, and then my postdoc is the rest of Rhodes University. Um, and then funding agencies, this is a broad range of, uh, of, of funding agencies that um, uh, fund the facilities and then obviously a, a lot of the, the, 
multiple science big projects within that. Um, and South Africa's National Research Foundation and through the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, contributes this uh, through funding for me and my postdoc uh, and, and uh, travel funds. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, um, many of you might be from some of those affiliated um, um, institutions, but from a South African perspective, and I'm sorry, I'm giving a little bit of a South African perspective, um, but on the left here, we have two South Africans, one based at, at Harvard, uh, Jonathan Weintraub, who's been a key role, played a key role within the engineering development of the PhD. Uh, he's a South African native born. And then Andre Young was at Harvard and has now moved to another um, key um, uh, PhD institute, which is Radboud University. Uh, and he's actually a project manager, a uh, project engineer of the African Millimeter Telescope, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Within uh, South African borders, my uh, subgroup of my of my research group works on expressing EHT work, um, and you can see a few of them there. So uh, I realise that not everyone knows about radio interferometry, so I just want to spend a couple of a handful of slides just introducing um, radio interferometry before moving on to just to give you a. a an idea of the of how the instrument works, um, and so that you can put those images um, and the science possible into into that context. So here is the EHT array observed from a roughly equatorial location. You can see these stations um, spread across the Earth, um, predominantly in the Americas, um, but this will be this will be changing quite a bit in the future. Um, the key thing is that you're not um, this is not a digital camera by any matter of means. I'm sorry for the, the, the Dreams Times um, background there. These aren't point and shoot uh, machines by any way. Um, the way to think about interferometry is, is handshakes, where it, here is the very large array in uh, near Socorro, New Mexico. And the way to think about this is pairs. And each pair measures a, um, a sample of the 2D Fourier transform of the, of the sky brightness distribution. So if you step through this, each of these is effectively a handshake per unit time, per unit frequency, and per polarization. Um, and if you extend that out, um, those are the fundamental measurements that um, the, the interferometer is making. So we have, have what we call baselines, and the, the very large array, which you see there, um, has 27 antennas, so number of handshakes in the room for any given group. Um, you've got 351 um, handshakes per unit time, per unit frequency, per polarization. For Meerkat, the radio telescope that we're building here in South Africa, there are 2016 of those with 64 antennas, um, which will then be expanded to 84 with the, with the German investment from, from um, Max Planck Society. Um, the square kilometer array in its, its mid-frequency array uh, in its first phase will bump that up to about 19,000. And then the SKA in its full right 3.1 million. Now the EHT by star contrast uh, effectively only has 15 um, of these baselines. Um, I put six there, in, uh, this is for the 2017 results. Um, I put uh, N equals six there. It, it's actually eight, but uh, in two sites, two geographic sites, we have co-located antennas. Uh, that's in Mauna Kea um, and in um, Kajunta, um, Alma and Apex are, are co-located. So effectively, the number of handshakes we're having uh, is, is far fewer and a very different ballgame, which is relevant to the imaging capability and the science that you can do. Um, and then key, another key aspect of interferometry is that the largest separation of these two, of, of all your antennas, determines the sharpness uh, with which you can image your angular resolution. Uh, that and the actual wavelength at which you observe. So this is, um, just before I came on this, I was busy um, setting the, the, the exam for my third year observational astronomy course. And this is a slide from that course where this building in the University of Pretoria, you can see some nice periodic structure, both vertically and horizontally there in the different stories and the windows. Uh, if you take the 2D Fourier transform, you see, sub, uh, you see structure across the image. There's power on uh, preferred scales. And if you only sample a subset of those, you can still reconstruct that image. That's just the inverse Fourier transform um, of that subset of uh, Fourier, 2D Fourier components. Um, and uh, this, in a nutshell, is, is what we try and do in interferometry. We try and reconstruct images as best we can with these very, very sparse measurements in the EHT's case. So you can see that um, an analogy 
um, well, you can see how sparse indeed this is um, across the entire Earth. The, the so-called filling factor is very, very low. When you think that the size of these antennas is of order uh, t 10 meters, um, it, it, it's, it's very sparse um, uh, filling factor indeed. You can see a lot of these dishes are quite chunky, um, and that's because they have to be machined to incredible precision um, because we're observing at a wavelength of about 1.3 millimeters. So if you look at the diffraction limits of this telescope, you're observing at 1.3 millimeters, your maximum baseline is of order 10,000 kilometers. So we achieve an angular resolution of, of around 20 micro arc seconds. Uh, if you compare that to a standard optical telescope, uh, that's more like one arc second. Um, so a very different, um, the, the highest angular resolution possible, uh, at least from the Earth in astronomy. Um, so the EHC in a nutshell is these very chunky dishes which have to be precisioned down to tens of micron um, RMS surface accuracy. Uh, they operate at 230 and 345 gigahertz. Um, it achieves an angular resolution, as I said, of around 20 micro arc seconds. That's a 230, but one of the main reasons of pushing up to, to 345 is to actually improve that angular resolution. So this is of order a thousand times better, finer than the, the Hubble Space Telescope. It's very much an experiment-driven um, uh, collaboration, the, the experiment being the attempt to spatially resolve event horizon scale emission towards Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, and M87, which I'll be discussing today. Um, and to use those to test um, the Kerr metric hypothesis, or at least any, any other theories of gravity once we improve our imaging. Um, really doing this in the strong field regime, um, in addition to that constraining accretion flow and, and jet launch physics, which is one of the key, um, key, asp uh, key uh, topics of investigation within high energy astrophysics. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, many people call this extreme interferometry. Uh, you're pushing to um, extremely short wavelengths, you're, you're, you've got antennas uh, across the earth um, and it really requires, going back to that team, um, a, a huge range of expertise in order to actually uh, perform this experiment. One of our biggest challenges is the, uh, the troposphere. Uh, not only is the opacity pretty poor at where we're observing around one millimeter with DHT, um, but the, the turbulence in the atmosphere um, distorts the phases that we measure at, at these wavelengths um, and dramatically so. So we have to go to, to high mountains and to extremely dry sites to actually do this. Uh, ideally you would do this in space, um, but that's pretty expensive when you have to machine the surface of, of the antenna down to tens of microns um, uh, precision. Um, so here are some of the sites. Uh, you can see some of the more spectacular places on the earth. Um, on the top left there, you've got Mauna Kea, um, in Hawaii, about 5,000 meters. The Greenland Telescope in the top right. Um, Alma um, with a you know a casual volcano in the background, and then the casual uh, military aircraft landing at a few telescopes. Some of you might recognize um, Bicep Two on the on the bottom right there, and then there's the South Pole Telescope, which participates in uh, EHT observations. Um, so quite fittingly, you know, to extreme to to image some of the extremes of physics, one needs to to go to the, use both the extremity of the earth and go to some of its extremes um, to get above that, that atmosphere and, and, and uh, overcome the, the tropospheric challenges that we face. Um, we may only have a few antennas, but the data needs to be recorded at incredibly high time and frequency resolution in order to tease out the, the covariance of the electric field at different sites. So for the um, 20, 2017 run, there's about four petabytes of data um, that need to be shipped, so they're put on a plane. Um, not a lot of high-speed data links from the South Pole, uh, as you want, might imagine. And with M87 alone, there was half a petabyte of data. So this is a um, um, few stations, but very, very large data set sizes. Um, and this is only set to increase by probably an order of magnitude in just the next few years with new stations and larger bandwidth. Uh, in contrast, and sometimes I think to myself, well, are we doing something wrong here? Um, the final image is a few kilobytes, uh, if that, and um, yeah, it really, um, the compression ratio is large. Anyway, so let me uh, go to the primary science goal. This is to spatially resolve events horizon scales of nearby supermassive black holes, specifically M87 and Sagittarius A star. And you can see a, a, a beautiful visualization of um, 
of an accretion flow onto a supermassive black hole and the, the, the relativistic jets that are stemming from that. This is Jordi Davao's work from Radboud University, um, which you can actually have a look at uh, in 3D if you wish. Uh, just have a look there. He wrote a paper on um, virtual reality uh, in um, viewing of, of supermassive black holes. But in the, right in the, in the center there is that, that feature that, that goes from bright to dark is broadly what we're talking about here. So a black hole shadow, um, this is a, a, a very old view graph from Jean-Paul uh, Lumet. And what you're looking at is, and I'm sure many of you have seen this many, many times by now, um, but essentially um, if one looks at the, not quite a white hole, but a black hole in the bottom, uh, bottom left there, and one has a thin, uh, geometrically thin accretion disk around that, um, the, the back of the black hole, uh, the, the local distortion to space time uh, deflects these light rays from both the top and the bottom of that accretion flow uh, behind the black hole. Um, and so one can see the, in principle, see the black hole essentially um, illuminated um, by, um, uh, in, 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 in uh, um, well, uh, projected uh, in, within this geometric, um, geometrically thin disk and the light bent around, over and below the black hole. Uh, and see a sharp contrast between the two. Um, so there's been quite a lot of work on this uh, historically, uh, looking at stars being lensed. Um, it's, 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 it's a whole um, history uh, stemming from uh, right back to soon after um, the proposal of GR, um, David Hilbert um, looking at light rays in, in the vicinity of a compact object, um, right through to very recently Hollywood blockbuster movies on the bottom right there, uh, I'm sure many have seen the Interstellar movie uh, with many things in between. So um, there's been a lot of discussion since the EHT results on exactly what the definition of that black hole shadow is and what, what is actually being observed. And I think there, I'm sure there are many experts in, on the Zoom link um, dealing with that. But for the purposes of just introducing the objectives of the EHT and, and what's been looked at so far, um, I will just say that, you know, there, there are two key concepts to those less familiar with this. There is the light bending around the black hole, um, photons spending more time in, in its vicinity effectively um, due to the altered light paths and the light captured by the black hole, um, which lead to this, to this feature, which you can see in this animation here uh, with photon paths um, um, elongated in its immediate vicinity and photon capture um, by the black hole. And if you look at that, and if you look at uh, the photons stemming from in, in that vicinity, uh, one sees this sort of contrast between a, a depression in the center uh, or a deficit of light versus some brightening uh, in the vicinity of that shadow-like feature. Uh, and that is the HD image that was presented uh, last year. So just capturing a still of that and going back to Geordi's beautiful simulation, um, you see the accretion flow falling into the black hole. This is synchrotron radiation, uh, very, very uh, um, dense magnetic fields in the, in, in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole. Um, and the shadow is basically capturing, and, and the, the way the infrarotor is designed, well, it's a byproduct of it, is that it is filtering out the highest brightness temperature emission, which is approaching or very near um, that, that photon sphere uh, where, where in principle pho photons can just orbit around the black hole. Um, so here you're seeing a simulation as well uh, with the photon ring, um, the event horizon, of course, uh, uh, well within that. And we use these simulated images to try and compare uh, what is observed versus um, theoretical expectations. And I'll come back to that in a bit. So for a short shield metric, for example, um, that photon, uh, photon ring um, is exceedingly small. Um, um, you've got uh, Newton's constant, the mass of the black hole, of course, and then the distance to the black hole. And this is uh, the angular size of that photon ring, its diameter. What's interesting is that the spin of the black hole is predicted to not really uh, change that diameter by a significant amount. It's about 10% change from a maximally um, um, spinning black hole through to um, of, of both negative spin and positive spin, where you've got the accretion flow in the black hole spin going from anti-aligned to aligned. So this, this means that this, this, this feature that is predicted is exceedingly small. And that's why we have to observe at 1.3 millimeters uh, or higher 
and use antennas that are spread across the earth, you're trying to image something with the apparent size of a donut on the moon, um, exceptionally small to try and get into that, to, to, to actually um, uh, see that, that feature and that, de uh, that light deficit that lies right at the heart, uh, was predicted to lie at the, at the heart of this uh, accretion flow. So there are two primary targets. Um, I said it's, the EHD is uh, experiment mode um, in many ways. Um, primary, primary science is this horizon scale science. And Sagittarius A star, you're seeing um, a, a model of what our Milky Way looks like, lies right in the heart of our Milky Way. Um, and this is a Meerkat image in, in orange that you're seeing there that was released at the Meerkat inauguration. Um, of that of that central region, you're seeing supernovae there, supernovae there, uh, supernova remnants. You're seeing um, and a whole lot of energetic activity in the immediate vicinity, magnetized filaments, all those linear features. Um, but that is the the uh, Sagittarius A star region, as seen by Meerkat, um, so directly above in uh, the skies. So that's a black hole of around four million times the mass of the sun. It's measured to exceptionally high, uh, pretty well exceptionally high. High by astronomical standards, um, accuracy of about 10%, um, photon ring size of order 50 micro arc seconds, and orbital time scales of order minutes, uh, depending on what the spin is. Um, whereas M87, which the first results, uh, is a different beast altogether. Uh, the, the black hole mass here is about 6 billion times the mass of the sun. Um, and the photon ring was predicted to be somewhere between about 20 and 40 micro arc seconds. And that was because um, estimates of the black hole mass uh, used both the ionized gas in its vicinity and just the stellar mass, which are effectively uh, stellar point sources, uh, which are basically gravitational point sources. And the two got answers that differed by a factor of two. Um, as you'll see, the, the, the EHD result is, more con is consistent with the stellar uh, kinematics, which is the larger um, 40 micro arc second estimate there. And here, in contrast, a more massive black hole is a, is a, sl is a slower black hole, if you will. Um, so here, the shortest orbit orbital timescales are more order weeks than, than minutes, which has a whole lot of implications for our ability to image this using aperture synthesis or interferometry and a rotating Earth. Um, right, so, so moving on to the, the, the first imaging results, and I'm sure you've seen this image many, many times. I wanted to just, interferometry is a, um, it, ch it changes vastly depending on the kind of uh, astrophysical object you're trying to image and, and the design of the array. So I just wanted to make one or two slides showing, contrasting this with, with Meerkat, uh, which I've already shown you this image of Sagittarius A star, um, and uh, which just kind of showed the, the, the remarkable uh, imaging fidelity of the Meerkat array, which sits in the Northern Cape in South Africa. Um, now, uh, some important people have uh, stood in front of that image, uh, President Ramaphosa and President Xi, and uh, some less important people on the right there, very important, 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 important person on the left, uh, Michal Kramer, which I'm sure many of you will know. Uh, he is a, a, a um, galactic center expert, as you can see, because he knows where it is. He's pointing to the correct position there, unlike uh, the other person on the right is. Um, but, yeah, uh, remarkable image, and the, the Sagittarius A star uh, lies right in the heart there. Uh, we predicted diameter of around 40 micro arc seconds, 50 micro arc seconds. So th there's the image, um, and what's been interesting since then is uh, seeing even larger scale structure. Meerkat is really good at imaging large scale structure uh, very, very well. And that image, if you zoom in even further out, actually seeing these magnetized uh, these, these bubbles uh, outflows from what is presumed to be an energetic event and actually is uh, energizing these filaments that you're seeing, these linear features. Anyway, that's a result from a more typical meerkat image is something like this. I've saturated it out, but essentially a deep meerkat image of order 20 hours basically just sees thousands and thousands of mostly point sources. You can see some linear features here, which are real. They are, are um, radio galaxies uh, that, are, that are near nearer. Um, and if you zoom in, sorry, that looks a little bit strange, but anyway, uh, you can just see loads and loads of point sources and then some, uh, some elongated. So that is in complete contrast with what we're doing with the EHT. The EHT has it both easy and hard because 
it, it's not attempting to image a huge patch of sky. In fact, it's tiny. The final image is of order a few kilobytes, whereas Meerkat images, um, a single image is more like um, 200 megabytes. And we have up to 32,000 channels, so 32,000 times that. So, and that's just for one direction in the sky. Uh, and then uh, the EHT, so the EHT has it easier in terms of how many images it's actually, uh, how many sources it concentrates on per, uh, per observation. Um, but it has it a lot harder for those atmospheric effects that I was mentioning uh, previously. Um, so this is that, uh, this is Messier 87, which was the first um, primary target, the EHT. You may have seen this image in classic textbooks, uh, this linear feature that was noticed by Curtis back in 1918, um, the first astrophysical jet evidence effectively. They didn't know it was a jet back then, but they noticed the radial uh, linear feature. Um, but if you look at that through radio telescopes, so you've got a low far uh, on the left here, seeing this huge radio halo, um, and a beautiful VLA image as you see the one-sided jet doppel boosted because it's um, uh, directed towards us. Uh, VLBI has had some remarkable results uh, in the past, really zooming in close to the, the, the base of that jet, but it really took EHT um, at 230 gigahertz and a few stations in order to actually image this and see for the first time that, that ring-like feature uh, that lies at its heart. Um, uh, just an advertisement for a student of mine who is busy producing a the Meerkat version of this. I told you that Meerkat's really good at making images of large diffuse structure and uh, Leon is, is doing some fantastic work there. Beyond the screen, the University of Pretoria. So um, that is that. That is the image uh, that was produced, and I'm sure many of you saw saw um, the, the the press response was was rather remarkable. Um, you have your head down and you're working hard, and then you can see that was uh, quite extraordinary. I think even more extraordinary was the um, reaction by um, memes, uh, a whole host of them. Uh, some of these are South African specific, so apologies to the international audience, but rather funny, I, I assure you. Um, but also published on that day was, uh, were six, six papers. Um, uh, and if you're just looking for an overview of the paper, well, of, of the results, um, paper one basically summarizes uh, in a letters-like format um, the, the, the entire result. If you're very interested in the array and instrumentation, which I guess is less relevant for, for this particular meeting. Um, but there is a very impressive engineering effort, as I pointed to earlier, uh, in building up this array, assembling this array uh, sites across the world. That's paper two. Uh, a lot of focus was put into redundancy in, in, um, in the EHT. And paper three looks at the, uh, presents the data processing and calibration, three different calibration pipelines, um, which is, fairly un unprecedented. Um, um, the folks put a fairly high bar on, on the presentation of these results, uh, results in ensuring uh, consistency. Um, and paper three uh, does an extraordinary job at that. Similarly, paper four presents three different imaging algorithms. Um, uh, one of them, the traditional method that we use in VLBI, but two uh, are forward modeling uh, maximum entropy methods that are really, really at the bleeding edge. And all three of these uh, have very, very consistent results. Paper five, I think, is the, the paper that would be most um, of greatest interest to this audience. Uh, that is the physical origin ring. It, it describes the uh, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations that um, are generated to look to do the model comparison, but also understanding the physics of what's of what's going on. Um, and then paper six. Uh, uses not imaging, but visibility plane methods. The fundamental measurement of an interferometer is, is a visibility, uh, that Fourier component. Um, and paper six developed some brand new techniques uh, to do the modeling directly in the visibility plane, um, and um, as well as doing some empirical calibrations on those GRMHD images to, to, com to, to, to make that um, conversion from uh, observing a diameter to going to a, a mass of a black hole. Right, so one of the fundamental things you can do is, you know, if you make an image like this, you can actually um, put a ruler down and, and measure what that angular diameter is and compare that with a host of theories of what, what, it, what one might expect it to be. To put this in contrast with LIGO, um, LIGO is measuring uh, black hole masses of order 
tens of solar masses. Um, so this is sort of nine orders, eight, nine orders of magnitude larger. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that things are consistent over that huge range so far, uh, at least with, with, uh, with general relative, with a, with a Kerr metric, but we'll come back to that in a sec. Um, I think a key thing to, to really push is uh, to, to, to emphasize is that this is not just one image. You saw one image uh, in press and things, but really this is, um, uh, there's a whole lot of redundancy and many different uh, imaging techniques used um, to, to, to image this. But also the, the beautiful thing about the Event Horizon Telescope is that these are bright sources and you can, you can repeat these experiments. And so what you're seeing in there is, is images on four separate days um, during the, the month of April in 2017, which presented last year. Um, what's also interesting is that this is all convolved with a 20 micro arc second beam. Um, so there are, there, are, there are details there that have been blurred out um, and may, may or may not be real. Um, and, but, but in these first results, the decision was made to, to have a consensus image um, and to smooth to 20 micro arc second resolution. Um, um, but I think you might be seeing some, some very interesting things in the future. Uh, exploiting that. Um, these are static images. Uh, each of those is a single day. Um, but one of the big fo uh, foci is really going towards um, making dynamical images, um, actually being able to make movies rather than um, just a static image. And that's on timescales of months down to hopefully hours. And if you recall the shortest orbital timescales, of M87 and, and Sagittarius A star range from months to, to days uh, and minutes um, in, in the most extreme case of Sagittarius A star. So, you know, really just staying on that theme of, you know, it's one, not just one image, just these are the three algorithms that we used. Um, Diffmap is a traditional VLBI algorithm uh, that's been around for 40 years and is very, very well understood. But these two new algorithms, EFT Imaging and Smiley, uh, really bleeding edge using maximum, uh, maximum entropy uh, techniques and forward modeling. Um, and you can see that despite the differences in, in approaches, there are very, very similar uh, image morphologies for this, first, for this first image. You can also notice the bright, brightness there. The imaging tests uh, that were done were extensive. Um, there was a lot of effort putting in, put in by the imaging working group uh, to really understand the performance of the imaging algorithms under different considerations, uh, different situations. Um, if you look, if you recall the radio images of M87 I showed, for example, that has a very large extended uh, jet that's much larger than the ring size, and that uh, is in principle um, invisible to the EHT, but in, in practice it can buy certain things. So what you're seeing here is, um, a set of synthetic data tests performed by the imaging working group to, to, to actually probe and, um, and understand any kind of biases that are involved in, in this process. Um, and then there are a whole host of tests done uh, with removing certain stations from the array, just ensuring that there is still um, um, very similar images uh, produced and, and the, the property of the image, specifically the diameter of that ring. Uh, so you can see that we're, we're still quite dependent on some of these stations, um, which really drives home the point of the need to expand the array um, to, to, to improve the redundancy, improve the imaging quality, and improve the ability to make images on shorter time intervals, specifically the intraday uh, time, time intervals, which are, which are far more relevant to, to Sagittarius A star, the lower mass black hole. What you're seeing here are a selection of three models. They're not best fits or anything. That they're a selection of three different models with different magnetic field uh, um, uh, structure with different spin. Uh, so you can see a uh, maximally spin, well, close to maximally spinning um, on, the, on the top right uh, with a, a star on 0.94. Um, you can see a short short black hole in the middle panel on the top. Um, and then a situation where you have the accretion flow in the black hole spin anti-aligned uh, with a negative spin. Um, then you're also seeing different electron temperature, electron to ion temperature ratios, the R high parameter. And I think what you can see here is that 
um, if you if you put that theoretical image through an instrument uh, simulator, which includes the you know the weather parameters and just to, do, to what degree uh, antennas are wobbling around the imperfections of the, the antenna, you, you can see that the images are very similar to the the real image that was recovered. And I guess there there are there are pros and cons to that. I think the you know the pro is that okay this probably means we understand both the theory and we understand the instrument, uh, which is encouraging. Um, but perhaps this demonstrates, you know, there are very different black holes and accretion flows um, on the top, top, uh, on the top panel there. Um, but yet they're, they're looking quite similar. So it speaks to uh, the hardware improvements that we need to make to the array to really start um, getting even more detail. Uh, you know, 20 micro seconds is never enough. And uh, I, I say that in a joking way. Um, and um, the efforts that need to go into the modeling to, be in sh to, to really be sure of um, the extracted features, uh, how, how consistent they are with, uh, how, well, our ability to actually discern between different model parameters um, when we actually use the real data. Right, so I think one of the successes of the EHT has been, you know, it's developed, it's this flagship project that has spearheaded a whole lot of work into um, new tools for very long baseline interferometry. Um, and these are going to be you know, more widely applicable. Uh, and this is one of the areas that I'm, that I'm uh, quite involved in. Um, basically looking at a transfer function from a simulation uh, on the left there through your Earth-sized telescope with, with weather, et cetera, and what you're actually able to recover. Um, I don't think this is as relevant to this audience, so um, I won't spend that much time on it, but synthetic data is, is a key part, not just in understanding our instrument, but in ensuring we understand the modeling process, um, what our extracted parameters are degenerate with. Um, so we've, we've done a lot of work in, in, in going into this. Um, things like weather, things like antennas wobbling, um, and a whole lot of work into ensuring that we can take theoretical images and put that through the exact same data reduction pipeline and calibration and processing that, that is applied to real data is applied to our synthetic uh, images uh, in order to compare this um, and, and ensure that we are understanding the effect of different steps along the way. So a key part of EHT is actually then taking that, that those data and actually doing model comparison and, and, and um, parameter estimation. Um, I mentioned the paper six did this not through imaging, but actually through um, a robust uh, well, an analysis of just the visibilities. And what you're seeing here is the, um, all the visibilities, their, their amplitude um, that were collected, uh, they're averaged over time and, and frequency, but as a function of baseline, uh, baseline length, so the unit there is in giga lambda. Um, so essentially around 10,000 kilometers on the bottom left. And what you can see for different, um, this, is, this is more just an, uh, an illustrative example. It's not any kind of fit or anything. Um, it's simply just to demonstrate that if you have a full disk versus a Gaussian versus a crescent, this is the behavior that you expect um, for those different features. And then it's uh, overplotted is just, um, again, not a plot, uh, not, a, not a best fit of any sort, just a, a demonstration of where those visibility amplitudes uh, sit. Um, so that is how you can constrain this, even without it making an image. Um, and um, a lot of effort is, has gone into that. Um, so image, image diameters were also measured with the, with the actual images, which have this problem of having um, spatially correlated noise because you've got, um, a very low filling factor of the interferometer. So there's lots of missing space between an antennas. So the noise in the image plane is, is, is terribly correlated. So that complicates extracting parameters directly from images. But nonetheless, you can see remarkable agreement here between the different algorithms um, and on different days for, for the radius, for the diameter uh, of, of that shadow feature, uh, which is extremely encouraging for the array. Um, if you do that in visibility space, uh, space uh, where you have uncorrelated noise, well, largely uncorrelated noise, nowhere near as correlated as the, uh, as the imaging domain, um, you can see here different frequencies and, and, uh, and the two main visibility analysis tools, Dynasty and, and Themis, uh, which again, uh, this is now in uh, 
um, angular gravitational radius, but uh, you can see a remarkable consistency consistency between these two over different days, um, which is extremely encouraging um, for the results. So if you want to take that a step further and not just measure the, di the diameter, but actually start to do some model comparison, well, one thing that was found fairly early on was that actually fairly complex models are, are required to actually fit these images. And I'm sure you can imagine that from just having a look at them. Um, certainly very basic geometric uh, or Gaussian-like models do not work. Um, you're looking at log likelihood on the, uh, well, delta log likelihood on the, on the y-axis as a function of the number of parameters used in different models. And um, yeah, you can immediately see that the crescent models are doing remarkably better. You can see the inset there zoomed in considerably, um, whereas very, very simplistic models are failing terribly. Um, this is an illustration of two of the geometric models uh, used to try and capture that. Um, um, and you can see quite, a, even though they are relatively simple, you have quite a large number of parameters uh, quite, quite quickly. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the two um, comparison techniques that were used, um, um, sorry, modeling, modeling algorithms, Themis and Dynasty, um, what you're looking at here are plots of the two-dimensional two posteriors, uh, pro uh, probability distributions of different physical parameters. What's not, not shown in this plot is actually the modeling of instrumental parameters, uh, something we call the antenna gains uh, that was used in this particular um, modeling process. And that, that it has to be embedded as well. Um, so the number of parameters is, is, is rather large, um, but you can see remarkable consistency between these two completely different approaches um, to modeling the visibilities and, and extracting and, and, and attempting to do um, uh, extracting uh, model parameters for um, those different uh, geometric models shown. So uh, a huge effort went into the, 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 the modeling, um, but what I'd like to touch on now is that the, the extracted parameters from that, both image plane and, and visibility plane, it was, there's, a, there's, there's some consistency with other observations. And one is that the, um, sorry, that is quite a pixelated image. Um, this, this gorgeous image of M87 at larger scales and lower frequency by Craig Walker and, uh, and collaborators. Um, this is at 43 gigahertz and you're basically zooming out um, um, and things are more opaque at the other base of the jet. And um, what, what's interesting is if you look at the different possibilities for the accretion flow and the spin orientation of the black hole, well, the, the dimming uh, to the north or the top of the EHT shadow image is consistent with Doppler dimming um, with the mission moving in the opposite direction compared to the brightening in the southern end. Um, and if this, this is all, you know, certainly not definitive, but it is consistent with these, these observations of, of, of the jet um, observed at many, many frequencies and Doppler, Doppler boosted towards us. In addition to that, there is ionized um, gas the, the, the very same ionized gas that is used to actually constrain the black hole mass um, through optical, tech, uh, optical observations. Um, that has a similar um, rotation orientation. So the, 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 um, the orientation of the black hole the spin is, is broadly consistent with these two um, aspects. What's also consistent is, uh, well, what's interesting is what, to compare those ionized gas measurements uh, of the black hole versus the stellar kinematics uh, measurements of the black hole. So on, in, in gray there, are you seeing on the, on the right, um, shading the, um, the, the ionized gas and, and stellar kinematics estimates of the black hole mass in M87. And you can see the black da uh, dotted lines. And you can see the EHT estimate of the black hole mass using three different techniques in blue, red, and green there. And that is strongly favoring and, and certainly consistent with the stellar, stellar kinematics uh, model. So this, this factor of two discrepancy, which um, was a challenge, uh, certainly the EHT seems to favor the, the stellar kinematics, um, which may be because the stars are, you know, these gravitational point sources rather than uh, being able to be influenced by non-gravitational effects, uh, either outflows of some sort from, you know, the center of the black hole, uh, 
that the region near the, near the supermassive black hole is, a, is an energetic place uh, and there might be all sorts of uh, effects that, that um, uh, impact and bias the, the ionized gas uh, estimate. Right, so looking ahead at what's, what's next for the, for the EHT and, and trying to um, speed up a little bit. Um, well, one of the things we certainly want to do is repeat the experiment um, and see if the ring is stable on one year time scales. This is for M87. Uh, for, for, for Sagittarius A star, I think you know, there's, a great, there's a huge amount of potential for, for making movies of Sagittarius A star. Um, and there's active work going on that. Um, the polarimetry is a major, major focus, um, trying to tease out the magnetic field structure uh, within that accretion flow in the immediate vicinity of the supermassive black hole to tell us a lot more about the actual feeding mechanism um, and the jet launch. And then there's a whole lot of what we call non-horizon science. Um, you may have recently seen a, a paper on 3C279, uh, which put some, uh, made some, some um, statements on potential, the, the helicity of the magnetic field structure through uh, the proper motions of um, um, plasma in the vicinity of 3C279. And then there's the, a major, major focus, which is the array expansion. So just to say one or two comments on, on polarimetry, uh, these are non-imaging results from Michael Johnson from a few years ago, which were just extremely interesting in that um, you can see here the, the UV plane um, towards the outskirts of the plot are effectively longer baselines, Fourier components measured by longer baselines. And you can see that the fractional polarization increases um, as a function of that, that baseline length. So smaller and smaller scales seem to see um, higher fractional polarization, but also that there seems to be some order um, in the position angles of those, uh, of those vectors. Uh, so this is, Michael's work really pointed towards uh, uh, polarimetry being a very, very powerful probe um, of this and some imaging simulations by um, Jason Dexter and Andrew Shale and others um, show uh, for different models what, what the um, structure might look like. Um, and being able to uh, carry out um, high fidelity images, uh, polarimetric image images of this is, is, a, is a key step to probing these accretion flows and different models for the magnetic field structure. Uh, then there's also this dynamical imaging. I'll return to this in a second. There's a whole lot of multi-wavelength coverage um, that is timed to be in, in, uh, around the same time. So there's, there's upcoming work on that. Um, and then I just wanted to mention one example of non-horizon science, which is OJ287, two, uh, uh, proposed uh, supermassive black hole binary. Um, it has this sort of quasi-periodic uh, light curve over many, many years. Um, and the prediction there, the, one of the models is that you actually have a black hole that is moving through the, the, the accretion disk and disrupting it and causing those quasi-periodic outflows. So there's, there's, there's quite a lot more to do. Um, then there's, of course, a big pulsar timing uh, uh, component to this. And Michael Kramer, who I showed earlier, is um, uh, one of the key figures in this. So the pulsar is, is in, the, in the far field, but you can do very, very accurate timing of pulsars um, uh, in order to um, add additional constraints to, um, to the black hole spin in particular. This will be really, really powerful. So you can see here the combination of the shadow, EHT shadow imaging plus finding one pulsar, and that shows uh, the constraints that are, that are possible there. Um, and Meerkat is actively involved in trying to search for uh, pulsars in the immediate vicinity of Sagittarius A star. Okay, so the final component is just talking about uh, is, is array expansion. Um, and as you saw in this image previously, well, it's very sparsely uh, covered. And uh, this is from an equatorial perspective, but if you look at from Sagittarius A star, which is at minus 27 degrees, um, that, that is even further emphasized how sparse the, the coverage is in the Southern hemisphere, which would improve the imaging of Sagittarius A star. And this little um, animation just shows exactly that. Here you're, you've got the earth rotating, and aperture synthesis is this process of using the change of projected baselines to measure more and more Fourier components. And as you do that, you are able to recover this image. So this demonstrates how, uh, gives you an idea of just how you can improve things by um, collecting more of these Fourier components. And one particular project that's looking at that 
um, is the African Millimeter Telescope. Uh, this is co-led by Radboud University and the University of Namibia. Um, so uh, Cape Tonians may think of that as Table Mountain. It's not. It's Table Mountain times 2.3. Uh, it's about 2,300 meters. It's the third highest mountain in Namibia. Um, and a, a remarkable sight. Uh, unfortunately, you're missing an image of me in the previous slide, um, which is me on top of that, at the very top of that winding road, which is basically the scariest four by four trip of my, of my life. Uh, well, any trip really. Um, but you can see a remarkably flat top mountain, just like Table Mountain, but 2.3 times higher. Uh, this is the proposed site. Um, and there is a proposed dish, which is um, the, the so-called CES telescope. Um, this is the Swedish uh, ESO um, telescope. It's, a, it's the same model as the Plateau de Boer um, telescopes, for those of you who know that interferometer. Um, and the, eye, the, 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 the attempt here is to get this dish on top of this mountain um, so that it can collect visibilities in partnership with these other stations um, uh, and improve the imaging. So there, there, there are a few things to see on this slide. So the first is that the yellow, the, the yellow um, stations are those that participated, participated in the 2017 run. Um, the orange are um, new uh, stations that, will be, that would have participated uh, in a non-pandemic uh, non year. Um, they would have participated this year for the first time. Um, but we had to cancel our, our run because of uh, COVID. Uh, and then in, um, in the turquoise are perspective new sites. And you can see Khamsberg, GAM, there's uh, the African site. And one of the, the, this is seen from an equatorial standpoint, but um, one of the real strengths of um, Khamsberg, or indeed any Southern African station, is having that east-west antenna with ALMA. ALMA is really that's the SKA of the Millimeter World, um, incredibly sensitive station, uh, incredibly good site. And so um, having a station, even if it's not that big a dish, that is um, on the same uh, latitude improves the array uh, remarkably because uh, east-west orientations are extremely important in interferometry and as the Earth rotates uh, in the constant in, in, in view of the aperture synthesis and changing the projected baselines and therefore measuring many different Fourier components. And as you can see at the moment, um, this, is, this is a rather north-south uh, array. So Southern Africa is a, is a key area for uh, a, a key strategic um, area to, to actually try and expand the array. So there is a big project. I just mentioned the AMT, but there's, there is something called the, uh, the next generation EHT, which is being um, led by Shep Dolman, the founding director of, um, of the, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. And this just shows you some of the imaging capability uh, this is from a paper by Lindy Blackburn. Uh, we have a simulation. You, have the, you take our 2017 array and you look at the recover, reco recovery of that, that shadow-like feature. And then proposing those few extra new stations, the NGEHT, uh, you can see a remarkably improved image. And this is when you can really start to test um, and discern between different uh, theoretical models of what that shadow feature should look like. The polarimetry uh, capabilities, which will be key, as I spoke about previously, are, are exceptionally enhanced. And you can see here just a simple blurred simulation by 20 micro arc second beam. Um, and then what you could actually recover with the, with the NGHT. So um, really, really promising. Um, and then I think perhaps, as I've emphasized, with Sagittarius A star, the lower, the lower mass black hole, um, which has orbital time scales of order minutes, um, that's where you, you really require high imaging fidelity on very short time intervals to be able to actually monitor um, these hotspots that are orbiting around black, uh, Sagittarius A star. I think that's where some of the huge potential of the NGHT uh, lies, especially if we get more of those stations in the Southern Hemisphere. And then uh, even more bold is to go to space. Um, so what you can see here is an image uh, reconstructed space for your BI. This is work uh, led by Frick Rulofs uh, of Radboud University um, and Heine Falke. Uh, you can see this image um, um, with, with just six meter dishes. This is a little bit outdated. They've looked at a They've looked at a third concept where they have a few, a few more stations. Um, but what you're seeing on the right there are, is the Fourier coverage. 
and you have these differential orbits, you can see those two red um, um, circles, and the differential orbits allow you to trace this spiral-like structure out in the UV plane. Uh, you're not limited to by the uh, rotation of the Earth and fixed locations on the Earth, um, and able to actually do some, some extremely uh, high precision imaging. So the key concept there is actually getting above the troposphere and not being affected by the turbulence in the troposphere. Um, this is uh, another paper demonstrating the uh, tremendous ability uh, or promise that space field BI shows. Um, this is by Michael Johnson. Um, and you can see the simulations. You can see the EHT 2020 array here, here which is of course uh, way better. Um, the reason these images like, might look a little, well, do look a little bit poorer compared to previous images that I've shown is, remember this is on very, very short time scales, trying to image uh, Sagittarius A star. And then if you add some um, spacecraft in low Earth orbit that are equipped with millimeter receivers, well, you can start to improve the imaging uh, quite remarkably and see very, very sharp features. Now, it's not just about improving the imaging, but another reason is as you improve the angular resolution, you actually bring other black holes into the play. Um, at the moment, but this is your five minute warning. Thank you. Uh, that should be good. Um, you bring other black holes into play. You are suddenly able to resolve horizon like features, um, horizon scale features for, for many, many more black holes. And this just shows uh, a plot of a few of those from that same paper, um, which is extremely encouraging. So it's not just about imaging fidelity and, and getting above the troposphere, um, but expanding your potential sample size. And then a uh, very, very um, uh, ambitious, but also extremely interesting is to look at, you know, the EHT, you can see we're limited to just the first couple of bumps, um, but there are many, many features um, at, very, at much higher angular resolution, which will really allow you to start to, to disentangle different th uh, theories in, in, uh, of gravity in, in, in significantly different ways. Um, so ambitious, but, but extremely exciting plans here. So um, in my final couple of minutes, I'll just finish with this um, beautiful image again by, of, of meerkats at the center of our galaxy and uh, also this um, target, primary next target for the Event Horizon Telescope. And this is a simulation by Michael Johnson where he shows a handful of African stations um, uh, in the current EHT array. And what you're gonna see is a simulation play out um, and then seeing how that can be recovered um, with circle dynamical imaging, a technique that, that Michael has championed. Uh, so there's the Earth rotating, you're seeing the different B, uh, uh, baselines, and you see that you're able to actually probe, uh, recover the shadow feature on very, very short time scales. The timer there is on the bottom left. So this really, uh, to me, demonstrates just how, um, just how powerful a, um, these extra stations on the African continent could be. Okay, so with that, my summary, um, I hope I've uh, at least uh, represented slightly the, the remarkably strong record of high impact science that the, that the EHT has done and how that is built on you know, a lot of engineering excellence. I've only been part of the EHT for, for four years now, but many of the project have worked for, for, for decades. Um, and then many of the young people in the collaboration uh, who are still doing their PhD have been some of the, the key people that have uh, led to remarkable results with this, uh, with this array. Um, so it's, it's a privilege to be part of this team uh, and play my small part. Um, it's achieved its primary goal. Um, it's captured this first image, but I, as I showed today, I think this, there is a great deal more to come um, in, 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 the, in the short, medium and, and long term, some ambitious plans. Um, with the current imaging quality, the, the black hole mass is, is certainly consistent with the, the stellar kin kinematics and the shape, the size and shape and system of GR. Um, it's, it's, we'd like to, to, to improve that for reasons I've shown. Um, the it's, it's very much an experiment mode for now, but there are a handful of other targets uh, and, and, and ancillary science that might be described in some observatories, but very high impact science in its own right. Um, I spoke a little bit about the tools and the techniques that were developed for the first time for these first results. Um, that's really gonna have a much broader impact than just this. And I think flagship projects have a, have a way of doing that. And then I hope I've shown the EHD expansion uh, on the African continent, hopefully, and um, certainly with space field BI longer term, uh, will significantly sharp, uh, sharpen the tests of gravity. 
So with that, I say thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. If you want to all switch on your switch off mute briefly, just to give Roger. Okay, so I. Great, thank you, Roger. I don't see any questions that have come up in the chat. So if anyone wants to raise a question, please do either raise your hand on the um, on the in the chat column. You can click on participants or chat to see that, or please do post a question in the chat space. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Or perhaps he was so clear. I doubt that. Okay, so um, we have a question from uh, Bandan Goyal. I am going to try to unmute him, or he can unmute himself, I believe. Um, sorry, with a sheet of 20 pages of speakers. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read out the question in the interest of time. So the question is, can in any way in the future a correlation or collaboration between VLBI and gravitational waves happen? So what is the future for collaboration between the, the uh, very long baseline interferometer and gravitational waves? I, I'm assuming he means the, the EHT. Roger? Yeah. So um, I know some people have thought about this. The, the, certainly within VLBI, if you, if you make it broader than um, broader than just the EHT. Uh, VLBI doesn't just give you very sharp images, but it also gives you very, very high uh, astrometric accuracy. So if you actually look at the distribution, statistical distribution of radio sources across the entire sky, um, and you monitor their, their absolute astrometry, or you can do it in a relative sense as well, um, and you do that over time, you can actually probe very low frequency gravitational waves in that way. And there have been a few, uh, a few papers on this in the last, in the last decade, um, showing the, well, putting constraints, uh, firstly, um, and then showing ways in which this can be expanded. I think the big way in which that can be expanded is with, the, with SKA VLBI, uh, which will be able to observe many of these sources at the same time, and actually be able to do the relative component of that experiment um, to much, much higher accuracy and therefore uh, improve the statistics across uh, a huge sky area. Um, for the EHT, um, there, there is some work on attempting to monitor um, the, again, using this astrometry, um, looking at uh, the periodic structure of um, um, looking for binary supermassive black holes effectively and monitoring their orbits over time. So there have been a few papers written about this. So if you could actually monitor the uh, astrometry over a few years uh, and do a pointed uh, gravitational wave experiment with a pulsar timing array, uh, for example, that, that is the estimate there because you, you're either going to be detecting that, um, but you certainly have the visual confirmation of these two black holes orbiting one another. We haven't found one of those, but that's certainly one of the interests in observing one of the sources I spoke of previously, OJ287, uh, which in principle for part of it orbit, uh, EHT should be able to resolve. So those are two key ways with you know, the EHT, the sort of uh, very narrow field of view, dedicated experiment versus SKA plus other stations looking at wide patches in the sky. I'm sure there are others, but those are the two that I can think of for the moment. Thank you, that, that was very clear. Um, ju just to explain, uh, I asked the question because the, uh, Bandan's mic was not working, which you communicated in the chat. So I've unmuted Alejandro Castro, who also has a question. Alejandra, are you there? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go okay. ahead. Sorry, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. 
uh, Roger. Um, you probably, I might have missed this during the talk, so I apologize if I wasn't fully paying attention, but I was just curious uh, about the measurement of angular momentum of the black hole itself. Uh, so what is the current estimate and what are the biggest challenges in like these next stages of measuring the spin of the black hole itself? So, so at the moment, a, um, a positive spin is preferred um, based on, um, but, but really the image cannot, the imaging quality at the moment really cannot constrain um, spin to, 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 at all really. Um, the impact on the photon sphere is around 10% for, for the full range of spin parameters. So um, the imaging quality is not good enough to do that right now. There are, uh, the EHD image com combined with other aspects allows you to constrain that. So for example, the X-ray luminosity requires a, um, a spin, um, uh, at least a highly spinning black hole, and then com that combining that with the, the image size, with the measured size of the black hole, means that it's, it's positive, it, it needs to be positive spin. So combining, the, using those two things together, one can say, okay, well, this is positive spin is preferred. Um, and fairly large spin for that X-ray luminosity. But directly from the image, uh, we have to improve our imaging quality quite considerably. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think there's a third raised hand though. It's a green tick. Uh, Alessandro, do you have a question? I have unmuted you, if you do. No, it was a previous uh, tick uh, because uh, ah. of uh, previous things that okay. have been asked. No yeah. problem. So if there's any other, if there's no other questions, just give a moment. Anyone have a question, a further question? Okay, so in which case, let's uh, unmute ourselves to thank uh, the speaker again. Roger, thank you very much. We're gonna take a short break so that everyone can sort of stretch their legs and their eyes. And we will join again in 25 minutes. So uh, th that'll be on the hour, wherever you are, it's on your next hour. In, in South African time, it will be 4 p.m. And we will join again for uh, the first plenary talk by Rajesh Gopakumar on deriving the ADS-3 CFT2 correspondence. If you want to leave the Zoom running, you can. You can also exit and rejoin. Uh, we will readmit you. So with that, let us take our first break. Thank you all.